Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much uh, for coming along to this lecture. And what I would hope that we achieve in the next 30 minutes or so is I try and convince you that instead of just using the eye to look outside your bodies at the world, we can actually use the eye to look within at the brain. So it's just starting off with a few fundamental things. What, what do we know about vision and what do we know about the eye and the brain? Well, when you see something, it actually is a very, very complicated route to how we actually perceive an image in the end. So over here, you can see what has happened is a signal from the eye travels along to, in fact, the part of the brain called the thalamus, and from there, it goes to the cortex at the back of the brain called the occipital cortex, which is where you actually see your image. In fact, um, there have been people who have used art to try and depict this, and this is just one of the, the many paintings around, showing that actually if you didn't have uh, the brain or even that particular part of the brain, you wouldn't be able to see anything at all. You wouldn't be able to perceive an image. So the brain obviously is terribly important for vision, as you know, for a lot of other things as well. And these are all pathways that basically require the same intrinsic structures. And what do I mean by that? Well, you may or may not have seen this sort of assimilation before, but each of these round bodies that you can see on the screen is a single nerve cell. And what's happening is they're sending signals to each other. So in that long pathway I showed you between the eye and the brain, there is a series of events that has to uh, occur and go in a very ordered fashion so that the signals are received in time to pr actually present to us something that our brain understands and we perceive as an image. And within this process you see these synapses where you have chemicals releasing to allow the signals to occur. So this is a very complex part of our beings and obviously it would be great if we could actually see these processes before our very eyes. Well, we can in the retina. It is the only part of the body that you can see individual cells, individual nerve cells functioning in their normal environment. So let's go back a bit to the eye because I've talked about the brain, I've talked about the eye sending messages to the brain, but how, how actually does it occur? Well, if you imagine it as a camera, as I'm sure you've heard the analogy many times before, what happens is a light has to pass to the back of the eye, which is the retina, which is, forms the film of the eye, and it stimulates a particular cell called the photoreceptor cell. And that cell, in turn, fires off a whole series of cells till eventually um, you get a nerve conducted back to the brain. So this is a section of the eye seen histologically, just to bring this notion a little bit clearer. And it consists of five different types of nerve cells, all very similar to the nerve cells that you see in the brain. But again, I will emphasize that the eye is the only place in the body because it's transparent. You see, just as, as you're using it to create an image to the brain because of its transparency, you can actually use that same transparent properties to image. And that basically is the fundamentals of the lecture today. Well, it's unique because you cannot do that in the brain. This is an x-ray of the brain. And what gets in the way? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? It's the skull, the bone. And if you could see the individual cells, it would be terribly helpful. But, you know, there are other techniques, and you may have all been aware of these. I hope you all haven't had one of these. But it's a very complex piece of machinery. Um, anyone who's been in one, I don't know if anyone has been in one here, will tell you that an MRI scanner is very claustrophobic, as is a PET scanner. And yet, to date, if you want to see signals in the brain, that's the way you have to do it. So just to show you historically, this is a CT head scan. This is the first time we were able to image the brain. This is an MRI scanner. Uh, this is a PET. And this is functional MRI, where you're seeing brain activities. But notice it's clumps 
of activity you see. You cannot individually see the cells working. So can we use the eye as a window onto the brain? Well, I've explained to you that we can take advantage of the fact that you have the transparent media to help you. And if you are readers of the Daily Mail, and if I can ask you to avert your eyes from Beyoncé, if I can possibly do that at this time of day, this is the headline that we managed to, to get uh, earlier this year. This is from the research from our group, which showed for the first time that it may indeed be possible to try and use the eye to pick up early Alzheimer's disease. And I'll discuss that in a little more detail as we go along. But let's just start off with another premise, which is what I often say to medical students and to ophthalmologists and try to convince my neurology colleagues that the eye is an extension of the brain. Is there any evidence of that? Well, the best evidence would come from what we know of the development of the brain, the embryology. From the time you have the first cells in the, the womb, the very, very elemental stages, the brain then subsequently gets formed through the whole cycle of being inside the uterus for 40 weeks, so that it's already specialised by the time the baby is born. But did you know that from the very early development of the brain, you have an outpouching of specialised tissue which is the retina. So the eye actually is formed from the brain even in those stages. And that is why the same nerve cells that you find in the brain are found in the eye. So let me put this in a different way. This is yet another video to show you how we can take advantage of this. This is using what's called an optical coherence tomogram, allowing you to look at the final details of the retina in a living person. This actually is a caricature here, showing you the photoreceptor cells that I've already discussed, and how maybe in the future it'll be possible to even show how those photoreceptors work and how they're eaten away when they've done their job. And this is very recent work, which has actually only just been published, showing you those individual photoreceptors, those cells that I said to you are at the bottom of the retina that pick up the light signals when the light enters the eye. And every small spot you see here is an individual photoreceptor. There's nowhere else in the body that you can see this. And this is in, in, a, in a human, a living person. So what else can we do using the eye? Well, um, as Bob Swan told you, I'm actually an ophthalmologist and my speciality is glaucoma and the, the, a lot of the research previously of our group has been based on glaucoma. And in glaucoma, what happens and why patients eventually lose their vision if they're not well treated is they lose their nerve cells. And this is showing you a model of the disease where the white spots are the healthy, intact retinal nerve cells. And over a period of time, and this is a model where the pressure is raised in the eye, you see the cells dying off. Another thing that we have done, and this is actually our most clinically relevant uh, uh, work, this started back a few years ago now, what we were trying to do is seeing if we could identify those cells that were not healthy. Because actually when you're trying to look at disease, you're trying to look at pathology, it's the unhealthy cells, it's the sick cells that you want to identify because they will tell you whether that person, patient really has any disease and whether they really are responding to treatment. So this process is, is really quite simple. It's based on the fact that cells that undergo a particular form of cell death, which is called apoptosis, you may have heard the term, or programmed cell death, have a specific characteristic where their cell membrane changes and you can label um, a marker to pick up those cells that are undergoing that disease process. So over here, this is again a model of the disease where you see the white spots indicating the cells that are dying through the process of apoptosis. So these are single nerve cells in a living eye. 
And currently, this work is being funded by the Wellcome Trust. Uh, we're hoping to start our, our first patient with this very same test. Initially, it will be glaucoma, but obviously, we are hoping it will be soon uh, used even for um, Alzheimer's uh, to try and use this as a way of picking up early disease and looking to see if we can look at the response of treatments. Well, what sort of machine do you use to see it? Well, I showed you why the brain is too complex to image very easily. If you compare the machine I show you, the, C the CT scanner, the MRI scanner, the PET scanner, you have to admit this is much simpler. You can have this in any optician's or optometrist's office, um, and it, it's non-invasive, and the patient feels uh, particularly comfortable. In fact, quite a few of you may already have had uh, a photograph taken on one of these machines because they're in such common usage. Um, I'm um, using guys from my group. This is Eduardo and this is Joanna. I have to say that uh, I don't think Joanna has Alzheimer's disease. She's uh, still a PhD student, but um, it serves the purpose to show you how easy this is to use. I'm just going to show you a video over here now because I think to explain Alzheimer's disease is terribly complex and I think this has a very good message on the mechanism of the disease. Which the human brain mistake. is a remarkable organ. Complex chemical and electrical processes take place within our brains that let us speak, move, see, remember, feel emotions, and make decisions. Inside a normal, healthy brain, billions of cells called neurons constantly communicate with one another. They receive messages from each other as electrical charges travel down the axon to the end of the neuron. The electrical charges release chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. The transmitters move across microscopic gaps or synapses between neurons. They bind to receptor sites on the dendrites of the next neuron. This cellular circuitry enables communication within the brain. Healthy neurotransmission is important for the brain to function well. Alzheimer's disease disrupts this intricate interplay. By compromising the ability of neurons to communicate with one another, the disease over time destroys memory and thinking skills. Scientific research has revealed some of the brain changes that take place in Alzheimer's disease. Abnormal structures called beta amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles are classic biological hallmarks of the disease. Plaques form when specific proteins in the neuron's cell membrane are processed differently. Normally, an enzyme called alpha secretase SNPs amyloid precursor protein, or APP, releasing a fragment. A second enzyme, gamma secretase, also SNPs APP in another place. These released fragments are thought to benefit neurons. In Alzheimer's disease, the first cut is made most often by another enzyme, beta secretase. That, combined with the cut made by gamma secretase, results in the release of short fragments of APP called beta amyloid. When these fragments clump together, they become toxic and interfere with the function of neurons. As more fragments are added, these oligomers increase in size and become insoluble, eventually forming beta amyloid plaques. Neurofibrillary tangles are made when a protein called tau is modified. In normal brain cells, tau stabilizes structures critical to the cell's internal transport system. Nutrients and other cellular cargo are carried up and down the structures called microtubules to all parts of the neuron. In Alzheimer's disease, abnormal tau separates from the microtubules, causing them to fall apart. Strands of this tau combine to form tangles inside the neuron, disabling the transport system and destroying the cell. Okay, well, I, I hope you did find that interesting. Um, there are a few principles in there that I will repeat later on. One is not only the fact that the nerve cells are dying, but that there are two lots of proteins that are implicated, those that are, you find in the brain that are deposited in Alzheimer patients, plaques, which are beta amyloid, and tangles that are made from a protein called tau. So how is Alzheimer's disease currently diagnosed? It's a very difficult one, and so for those of you who, who um, have friends or relatives with the disease, you'll know that un unfortunately, despite 
all the advances that have been made in this area for, for a long time, it's the fact that we have a very few objective ways of picking out Alzheimer's disease until there are very symptomatic patients. And actually, as you know, you don't want to really identify your patient far down the way. You want to identify them early. The current way of thinking is in addition to checking a mental state examination to see how cognitively intact your patient is, in other words, what their memory is like, you can do a whole lot of screening tests to um, omit other causes of disease, but then you end up relying on, on scanning. And it's only serial scans, scans that you do over a period of time, that really will tell you if if the disease is progressing. And sometimes that's what's used to help in the diagnosis and certainly in clinical trials of potential drugs that has to be used. So terribly expensive clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease because you're relying on these rather soft signs. But why is this important? Well, you know that our population, our aging population, is increasing. These are the expected rates of Alzheimer's disease over the next few years. And something that I think makes us all, well, hope that we don't live too long, will be this, this statistic that by the time you're 90, your incidence or your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease goes up to one in two. So 50% of people over the age of 95 are going to develop Alzheimer's disease. So it's a significant cause of disability, and one of the reasons why that is the case, and I have said this already, but I will repeat it, is because by the time we pick up this disease, it's actually very late. And why is that? Well, this is still what we're all searching for. The unmet need in Alzheimer's disease is a screening test that is sensitive enough to pick up the disease early so that you can actually begin treatments. And there are treatments out there. If you were to look at the website for clinicaltrials.gov and you actually looked at the keyword of Alzheimer's disease, there is a whole load of uh, neuroprotective treatments that are currently being trialed. But one of the big problems is how do you show that they work very easily? Can the retina be used. I'm not going to review all the literature on this, but the, these two papers perhaps show what I'm trying to say. So we've talked about an Alzheimer's disease that the nerve cells die, and actually there is very good evidence, because the retina is an extension of the brain, that the nerve cells in the retina also die in Alzheimer's. So was, this work was back in 1995 by uh, Blanks et al, who showed that if you count the number of nerve cells in post-mortem eyes of patients with Alzheimer's disease, there is a significantly lower number of nerve cells than in an age-matched control. Now, one step beyond that is instead of just looking at the individual nerves, you could also look at the nerve fibers. And so far, our imaging technology, using the techniques that, interestingly, is what I apply every day to my glaucoma patients, where we measure the thickness of the nerve fibers in the retina of the eye. If you use those same machines to look at Alzheimer patients, again, there is a significant reduction in the thickness of the nerve fiber layer showing that the retina is involved. What other evidence is there? Well, in this day and age where there are transgenic models of every disease, the very good models of Alzheimer's disease have shown that in the retina itself, the protein beta amyloid, if you remember back to the video I showed you earlier, that is implicated in the plaque deposition in brains and Alzheimer patients, is also deposited in the retina amongst the nerve cells in the transgenic uh, models. Likewise, our, our group has very recently shown that in a different type of transgenic model, you see not only an increase in the level of this beta amyloid, but also in the levels of tau, and remember, tau was the other protein that is strongly highlighted as a hallmark in Alzheimer brains where it forms the tangles. A very recent paper has been this one, which is shown in human eyes. So this is post-mortem again, that you can actually visualize and pick up the individual beta amyloid plaques. So the retina is becoming more and more 
one of the most um, exciting parts of the human body that can be accessed but also be used to look and hopefully try and identify early disease. Just going back to our own work from the group regarding glaucoma, and there are very close parallels with lots of diseases that involve nerve cell loss in the brain, as also in the retina. Glaucoma is one of them. Uh, we are one of the first groups who showed conclusively that in the retina, where you have this protein beta amyloid, the PLOC protein in Alzheimer's disease, present in the retina, in the nerve cells, you also have apoptosis or cell death okay so in other words in a glaucoma model beta amyloid is very important and you can identify that where the beta amyloid is present you have nerve cells dying well is that important enough for us to, to, to actually pay attention to well this is further evidence from our group so this is a normal eye and I did describe to you the technique that we've given the acronym DARK, which is de the detection of apoptosing retinal cells. This is the technique that is currently going forward to a phase one clinical trial. This is the same technique we've applied here to a normal lie, where we've given an injection of beta amyloid. And you can see in this video here that over a period of time, the beta amyloid is initiating and causing cell death. Those are the white spots that you can see on the retina. Now, I want you to cast your mind back again to that rather long video that I showed you regarding Alzheimer's disease and the mechanisms of disease. And there were some key enzymes that you heard in the pathway of making the beta amyloid. I don't know if you can remember those. One, one was the secretase enzymes that clipped the longer protein. Well, in our models, what we did was we tried to assess whether treatments that are already currently in use in clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease could prevent the uh, cell death in the retina caused by glaucoma. And in this paper, what we showed that an antibody to beta amyloid reduced the number of dead cells quite significantly after just one treatment. So that's an extremely encouraging result because that antibody actually is already on trial in patients. It's a phase three trial in Alzheimer's patients. But also uh, we looked at other uh, ways of doing that. One is the beta secretase enzyme. That was less effective but still reduced the number of um, cells that were dying in the retina. And also Congo Red, which stops the um, beta amyloid actually forming the plaques, basically, when it aggregates. So again, this is encouraging because it's the only place in the body that you can realistically look to see whether the response of treatment is actually changing the course of cell death. This is a another video. This is, again, very recent work from our group. Um, it's a living eye once more. And instead of just black and white here, we've used different markers of different types or different phases of cell death. So what you're seeing is some cells are dying through um, a process called necrosis, which is different from what I described earlier, which is apoptosis. Those are the two main forms of cell death. And also, very importantly, you can judge at what phase of this death process your cell is in. And the implications of that is in the, in the very early stages of apoptosis, and it's been recently shown by us and other people as well, you can reverse the cell. So the cell doesn't go down that committed pathway of cell death. It can actually go back to its healthy state. And that is what we would like our treatments to work on, is to actually stop the cell getting unhealthy and be going reversing to being healthy again. So I'm just going to um, I'll probably gallop through this more than I'd intended to, but it gives us more time um, for me to answer questions. I'll end with this, the last slide, and I'm sure one thing you remember would be the, the Daily Mail um, headlines that I showed you, probably more for Beyonce rather than our headlines. But the, uh, the actual data that accompanied that headline was this picture. So this is a, a transgenic model of Alzheimer's disease, where in green... In the retina, you are actually seeing cells dying through apoptosis. And that would suggest that we were eyeing the very early stages of disease because 
in this particular model, at the time we were looking at, there is very little evidence yet of the symptoms being developed, so that they have very few behavioural defects. So this is very early on in the natural history. And in this very same model, the other thing that we did show was when we stressed the retina, um, and there are various ways of doing this, but when we added some sort of stress, we could visualise actually the stress response immediately. We could pick up the fact that the retina under stress had very many more cells undergoing early apoptosis. Well, I'll end here, and I need to thank there's all of this work, and I've just briefly uh, gone to it rather superficially, I'm afraid, um, is due to some very hard-working people within the group, and I've named some of them here. This is us looking fairly happy at our Christmas um, dinner last year, but I'm particularly indebted to the Wellcome Trust. Uh, they've actually supported me since uh, 1996 now, really, and the work in the group is very much part of that. Uh, I'll be very happy to take questions um, if you'd like. Thank you.